my dad died 32 years ago and then mum died uh, and outlived him by, by that uh, amount of time she died last year that was that was heartbreaking for me mm. because, but what was really good was that she had a faith that she believed that when she woke up on the other side the first person she would see would be my father well, I am joined today by not only a TV presenter, the best there is, but also a great friend um, of you and your wife, the gorgeous Eamon Holmes. Colleen, thank you very much. Thank you. Who would have thought we'd be here talking death <laughs> at our young tender age? And still laughing. And still laughing. You can't <laughs> laugh it, at death. You, you can. can well, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And I think our heritage and Irish heritage yes. is... Um, Always filled, filled with humour. Well, in the worst situations, really. In the worst really. situations, you know. I remember when I was five or six or whatever. We lived in a great community called the New Lodge Road, and the New Lodge Road had butchers and bakers and candlestick makers, and we had a fruit and veg shop next door. <coughs> and you know, th there was a community. There. Mm. there was a real sense of community. And in those days, in the sixties, when someone died. People pulled on, people had paper blinds and they pulled the blinds down or the blinds were at half mast sort of thing. So you could always tell someone on the road had died and it was a, a mark of respect. And then <laughs> this bit happened. Your mum and dad would need to go and visit the corpse, visit the body, right? And the body was laid out in the parlour or in someone's house. they do that, don't yeah. they? Do they yeah. still do that in Ireland? Oh, yes, my mother was laid out. And really? She just died last November, yeah. So um, they would say, right, where, where are we going? Put your coat on, put your shoes on, put your... Where are we going? We're going to see Mrs Brennan. <laughs> but Mrs Brennan's dead. Yes, that's why we're going to see her. <laughs> we're going to see her. Wow. So suddenly, right, you'd go with your brothers, you'd hold hands, and mum and dad would call, and there'd be a queue outside Mrs. Brennan's house, and people coming in and saying, very sorry, very sorry. And they'd be given a cup of tea or a whiskey or something mm. like that, you know. And they would go and they'd stand over the coffin, and they would say, oh, she was a great woman. She was, oh, she mm. looks, and they always would say this, she looks beautiful. She's beautiful. No. Look at her there. Look at her hair. No. Look at her lip. You'd have to have the full war yes. paint on if you were doing this. And then you'd stand there and somebody belonging to Mrs. Brennan, Mrs. Brennan's husband or son or whatever, would come up and say, would you like to kiss Mrs. Brennan? What, as a child? <laughs> yes. And you'd go, no. No. And then your mum and dad would shake and say, yes, they would like to kiss Mrs. Brennan. Yes, yes. So you had to then either touch Mrs. Brennan's hand or kiss her hand or kiss her on the forehead. And so from a very, very early age, I knew what death felt like, what mm. a dead body felt like. And that was normal practice. That was people coming and paying their respects. And in those same days, you know, when Mrs. Brennan's body left the house, people would line the streets and people would tip their hats. And there was a respect thing. Whereas today, I think people are somewhat embarrassed or inconvenienced uh, by, by death. But I'll tell you, sorry, just while it's in my head, would I tell you this? My granny, my father's father, my father's mother lived in our house, right? Mm. So, which is a two up, two down house. Mm. Don't know how they find space for us all. But and me and my brother, Bran, who's a year younger than me, were playing in the landing and stairs. And we tumbled down the stairs and on the carpet. And we were having a great time at about six o'clock in the morning. And we came to what was called, we had the, 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 the drawing room and what was called the parlour. The parlour was the good room. And... We hit the parlour door as we were rough and tumbling about and the parlour door opened. And we went in and went, what's this? What's this? <laughs> into the parlour floor. The parlour's where you normally have like the Christmas tree up yeah. at Christmas and whatever. And it was amazing. There was something right in the middle of the parlour floor. So Bran and I went over to the edge of this and peeked our heads up over the edge of it and looked down and went, Because there was our granny. So we wow. ran upstairs. We ran upstairs to mum and dad who were in bed. And we said to them, Mummy, daddy, mummy, daddy, granny's dead in the parlour. <laughs> <laughs> of course, all of this would have happened the night. We'd have been in bed from six yeah. o'clock or something the night before. She would have been, there would have been a mass for whatever. She'd have been brought home and she's laid out in the parlour. But her dead body was there and no one had told us <gasps> that she had died. Wow. Yeah. Did, it affect, did it affect you that? 
I, I mean, Brian and I talk about it to this day. So yes, it does. I can't. Say, but look, honestly, it was it was comical. This is why I say sometimes it's how you deal with things. She was an old woman. Mm. She had dementia. Uh, well, we didn't know this at the time, mm. but um, there she was, just laid out, and and that's why you, when you were saying to me, and they st- and they lay people out. I mean, that's still anybody I know, anybody who's certainly of a previous generation, they don't do funeral parlours or whatever, they will want to be laid out in their house. That's where they lived and that's where they died. Yeah, no, I remember because obviously I've lost family members and yeah. we'd go and see them at the funeral parlour. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I could handle them in yeah. the lounge yeah. No, I know. And, and then when they're gone, thinking yeah. that they were there. Yeah. My mother used to sit and say things like, you should bring people into the house and she'd talk to people and she would say things like, Uh, Yes, and I got that fireplace and that mirror, we got that in the co-op, that mirror's lovely over there, whatever it is. And there, see there under the windows, that's where Leonard was laid out. Oh. And he was beautiful. (laughs) It was lovely there and we had him under, and the curtains were there behind him in the wind. So do you think that's kind of like a a healthier way, maybe? Uh, Certainly in terms of talking about it, yes. Mm. I, I, I find since, you know, moving to England, I came to England in 86, and I suddenly realised death wasn't treated the same way. It was not spoken about. Mm. And I apply that even to people who are in my family who are not Irish. And it's, it's, it's anathema to me and, you know, my brothers and whatever, because death is so natural. Ruth, my wife, has a, a thing where she would say to me, you're not going to another funeral. What, 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 are, you, what are you going to funeral now? And, and she'll say, you know, I'll say, well, I'm going to Jimmy's father's funeral. You didn't know Jimmy's father. Why are you at Jimmy's father's funeral? But I know Jimmy. I work it's with Jimmy. It's a mark Jimmy, of respect. And it's a mark yeah. of respect there to be there. She doesn't get that. Mm. You didn't know the person. You shouldn't be there. And a lot of people are like that. Yeah. But I'm not like that. I'm no. a professional funeral goer. <laughs> and, and, you know, there are people. It's, it's, it's a amazing. great job description. That. Well, do you know, there are people who you can rely on being at funerals. I know a lot of people of that generation and that is seen as their duty and I would see that as my duty. Yeah, I think that is a very um, Irish thing as well because my family mm. are like that. They go to funerals and they'll say, are you coming? And I go, I don't, I've never met them before in my life. And they go, no, but we worked with them back in or yeah. we worked with the yeah. sister back in, you know, 1973. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I was about seven. Um, but see, they, well, they still go. Also, Colleen, if I was gone, I would politely expect my children to represent me if it was one of my close friends mm. who had died. I wouldn't want, and I think this is what happens when really old people died, everybody they knew has died off. Mm. So sometimes it's sad to go to a funeral and there are 10 people there yeah, or yeah. whatever. And I think it's up to my children here and I in their 30s to represent me if I'm not there or I'm mm. hospitalized or whatever that they should be representing the family, just paying tribute like that. That's me. Mm. That's just the way yeah, I yeah. think. I'd like to think you'd come to my funeral. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I, 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 hopefully not for many, many years. Hopefully Amy. not. Thank you. Hopefully not. You're right. Though. I will come to your funeral if your wife lets me. <laughs> yeah. she, she's she keeps trying jealous. to keep us apart, yeah. Damon. I'm She'd not be very happy jealous. She, she would, would hate to think that, well, if she died first, then I'd be having any joy <laughs> at all in my life. <laughs> If she goes, <laughs> that's the end of all joy. Aww, That'd be it. That's sweet. But did you find that... Um, so do you think it's important, especially for, you know, a lot of people don't know how to um, explain to their kids about death. Yes. Or, But it seems that you were brought up where it's very you almost became immune to it in a way yes, that, correct, you know, yeah. Mrs. whoever down the road, we've mm-hmm. got to go and see her and kiss yeah. her hand. Did that make it easier for you as a child to accept? Yes, so it do you was, think it's important for people to maybe... Well, it, it was Because a lot of people keep their kids away, don't they? Definitely. And look, horses for courses, whatever. But I was of a generation, you know, being a very young child in the in the 60s, a uh, teenager in the 70s, and in my 20s, beyond in, in the 80s, that it was there, was... there was definitely a sense of community. Mm. So living in Belfast... Your cousins lived around the corner. There was always cousins mm. on daddy's side and mommy's side. Blah, blah, blah. So we had, Ruth, Ruth says to me, you had the biggest family circle <laughs> I've ever heard of. But, but we hadn't. Mm. We just had cousins. Yeah. You know, so my mum had, you know, three sisters and a, and a brother and they all mm. had 
five children each. Yeah. So there are suddenly Same 20. Same as ours, yeah. Yeah. I so, meet cousins now that I've never met in my life. You yeah. go, I'm your cousin from your mother's third whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. But so then you had a duty when someone died in that family circle to be there and to visit and to, you know, go to the wakes and, and whatever. And therefore, I think it was much more normalised. Okay, then moved to England. You know, I lived, I've lived in Manchester, mm. I've lived in London. And you haven't got close kin around mm. you. Therefore, your opportunities of doing that sort of thing are much less. And the distances between people are much further apart. Mm. So I think that sort of prevents that in happening. But I think family around you and being consoled by people and people who are sharing your yeah. grief. Um, you know, if I can share someone's grief or someone can share my grief, then I think that mm. is a great help. Mm. And I, I noticed um, one of the things when my sister Bernie passed away, surrounded by family, obviously, and loads of great friends, but it was those people as you drove by who tipped their hat or just bowed their head, just total strangers. And it means so much to you, doesn't it, at the time? It's a tremendous mark of respect. It really is, even yeah. though they didn't they didn't know us, mm -hmm. you know, but it was. I remember it being so touched. touched by that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's important. <clears throat> I mean, we talk about um, we talk about grief, and I know you lost your beloved mum last year. Last November, yeah. Um, and the tragedy for you was you couldn't make it to the funeral. Just couldn't believe that. Of all things, you know, you expect to be at your parents' funerals. Mm. Uh, my dad died thirty-two years ago. And uh, then mum died uh, and outlived him by, by that uh, amount of time. She died last year. And I had this back problem and then I had an operation that went wrong. Mm. And then I fell down the stairs and broke my shoulder. So basically I had two legs that didn't work and a shoulder that didn't work. And mum died. And, um, you know, I couldn't get on a plane. We talked about air ambulances carrying you over doing this. But then at the other side... How would I get into the church? How would I sit down? Mm. How would I, where would I stay? What would I do? And it just became, and I was in great pain. It wasn't mm. a question of, well, I won't die. No, mm. it wasn't like that. It just was, I physically couldn't get out of bed. I had carers who would bring me to the bathroom, who would dress me. And it, it was, was when it was really bad, really wasn't bad. it, for you? Really, yeah. really bad, really, really bad. And um, that was, that was heartbreaking for me. Mm. Because, but what was really good was that she had a faith that she believed that when she woke up on the other side, the first person she would see would be my father. Mm. And she was a professional widow for those 32 years that he had gone. And, you know, they met when they were 15. And that was true love. Mm. I mean, it was, they weren't Darby and Joan. They were like, I mean, they, they bickered and they ride and they whatever, but you could tell it was, pure love um, between them. And she has she had a faith which was unshakable mm. that she would see him. And then she would have these conversations with you. Do you think your daddy will be older now? Oh. Or what? Or do you think he looks the same? I said, well, he better not look the same because look at you. you know, <laughs> no, I say, do you think he'd not recognise me now? I said, mum, he will have aged the same as you will have aged and mm. you'll recognise or else you'll go back to when you last saw him and you'll, you'll both be the same. But I find her faith very comforting because we, my brothers and I, we just knew in our hearts she believed she's going to see Daddy. Same as my mum. Yeah. You know, I envied her faith because I yes. didn't carry that faith, to mm -hmm. be honest. But I, um, I used to tell her when she was alive, when somebody close in the family had died, my mum would be, well, they're going to a better place. And I used to envy that because while I'm sitting there bawling my eyes out, she was getting <clears throat> she was getting comfort from it. Did that help you then in your grief? Definitely, absolutely, definitely. Look, my dad, as I say, 1991, April the 3rd, 1991, he took a heart attack and died. I was abroad filming uh, for the BBC and I had to get back. And those were the longest plane journeys of my life. To get the last flight, I, I was coming from Israel and then I had to get to London. And then I had to get the last flight out of Heathrow that night. And I got up by the skin of my teeth. And it was long. I'm waiting to know you were going back to see someone dead, unexpectedly mm. dead. Um, he was the same age as I am now. And I have to say this, Colleen, that um, 
in all that time, I think of my dad every day and I miss my dad every day and because there was so much unsaid between yeah. us. And uh, he was he was a good man and yet I was probably mentally and physically closer to my mother, probably. Mm. Probably. Yeah, yeah. It's not that I didn't love my dad. I did love my dad mm. very much, but me and my mum were like two peas in a pod. But I've never wept for my mum. Mm. But I could weep easily for my dad. And it's a strange thing because I I actually wanted God to take my mum because she was suffering so much in yeah. the illness. My mum mentally sharp as a tack at 94. Absolutely. Mentally, she could take on anybody. But her body was weak and frail and mm. it was humiliating. She was a woman of great dignity. And to watch her being cared for. And, and she wouldn't accept care. This was the awful thing I used mm. to say to her. She wouldn't accept care people coming into her she expected her sons to do it and she would always mm. say if only i had have had daughters instead of sons oh. these are all useless <laughs> that was the way she was she was just funny <laughs> but we were saying mom this is not right we shouldn't be doing this and the boys shouldn't be looking after i mean i got off lightly because i'm living in england mm. but um she definitely um just had great dignity and i watched that dignity go with her so it's uh, almost a relief when they go. It was, was for it, my it mom. Was a, it was. It was. You know, I did. I don't think I grieved for my mom for a good two years after she passed because for me it was just a relief because yeah. I it was a different person by the time she totally. left because she had Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. which was just awful to watch. So it was a relief. But how do you deal? How do you deal with your grief? Do you know what? I do believe that if you think of someone every day, they're never gone. Mm. And the amount of times, you know, the amount of times I think of my dad and sayings that he had, you know, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Don't mm. do it if you're not going to do it well. And it would come into my head. And today I was getting off a bench and I have to think, I had to really think about getting up. And I'm going one, two, three before I launch myself. <laughs> and... And in my mind came this rhyme that my mother used to say all the time. So I'm going, one, two, three. And then here, Mary Ann McGee, she knocked <laughs> on the door and turned around the key. Oh. And, I'm going, and it was, I think it was the skipping rhyme yes. she used to have, my right? used to do it. Yeah. yeah, said it all the time. And, and it's funny how you finish sentences. So do you know what I mean where people aren't dead? They are always there in your yeah. life because they have left this. And also you have traits of them. Yes, yes. You know, I say things and do things and think, oh, my God, I sound like my mother. Yeah. Things that I said as a kid, I'm never going to say that to my kids. Yeah. I now find myself yeah. saying. Do you? But, yeah, I mean, what about now? How important do you think it is to talk to family members about death, about funerals, yes. and certainly about how you want your funeral to be? Well, I think it serves no purpose, especially if you know you're at a certain age or especially if you know that you've got an illness or whatever, it serves no purpose not to make life easier for the people left behind because they want to do the best by mm. you. And, you know, there's no point saying, I don't want anybody in black, I want people in gay, bright colours and whatever it is. You know, if someone imposing that, if you think she would have hated that or he would have hated mm. that, you know, I think it's important that people know that they can say at the end of the day, she would have loved this. Mm. She would have if shown if she was here to see this or he mm. was here to see this. Which is what my sister Bernie did. What she did. Every single detail of her funeral right. she'd put down, including who went in what car. Yes. Um, what flowers she wanted, what she didn't want any. She was very much an it atheist, Bernie. But it was a production for her. It was a too. production. Yeah. And I cannot tell you how much stress it took off the family yeah. on the day. There was no stress. Because even people that might go, well, I, you know, I want to sit in that car. It was like. Well, no, but Bernie wants you to sit in this one. So, so no one could row. Yeah. So there was no rows between family members who wants what it's and who what thinks Bernie what. Wanted. It's absolutely all day. It's what Bernie wanted. And it really, really took the stress out of, because funerals are hard. No matter yeah. how you can laugh and all of that, but, yes, but they are cry in the corner. hard. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so to take that stress off was the first time I thought, oh, because no one likes talking about their own death, really. Or thinking about it. I think that's the problem. With so, Eamon, how important do you think it is to have the conversation with your loved ones about how you want your funeral to be? Colin, 
I think when it happens, even if you know what's going to happen, people are rarely organised. And think of the favour that you're doing everyone around you by just making it easier, by just saying, do you know what? I remember with mum, it was readings. It was like, well, what readings would she want or what? I knew she wanted sort of traditional Irish music, so we then had to go and get this. She didn't know mm. how to get this. And then I got a, a singer um, who just stood at the side of the altar and sang these Gaelic hymns and things. And that was a big, big weight of everyone's mind. What was then really hard was to get speakers, was to get people who actually wanted to mm. do a reading and could uh, physically and, and mentally and emotionally do a reading. Um, you know, But did you... Because you knew your mum so well, mm. so you were able to go, this is what mum would have liked. But she, would no, it have she, been easier if she'd have had no, she did, all of that I think what I was going to say was that she did, she chose her own reading. Right, okay. Um, the music was sort of left to us, but we knew... The music she liked. Yes, yeah. the type of music that she liked. And listen, there was, you know, Malachi Kush who, who sang and, and getting Malachi, who is a uh, part-time school teacher, um, was, was just incredible. She adored Malachi, you know, mm. so good. But just think of the pressure that takes off people, you know, to, that people just want to carry out your wishes. Yeah. Would he be happy? Would she be happy? Does this do them mm. proud? And and I and I think it's great. I think if you can go to, you know, a, a company and they can arrange this for you, I see it. I think it's the most important part of your life. So do I. You know, people say, oh, marriage is important and whatever, whatever. But how you say goodbye to someone mm. is really important. Mm. And who says goodbye to them? And I think it's people's duty to turn up. I really do think it's a duty. And to be proud to have been there and say, I was there to say goodbye. Mm, mm. And a whole conversation from every age, because we always assume we're all going to be old. But mm -hmm. actually, it's a conversation that should start. Me and my kids have the conversation now. They ask me what I want. I go to them, what and would you want? you're not even remotely old. Oh, Look thanks, at you. Simon. Yeah, but yeah. your eyes have gone as well as your back. Um, but equally, the, um, but we do. You know, my kids, I ask them what they want. God forbid. Because I, you know. God forbid. I hope but that never happens. we have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it already makes me feel, okay, we all know now. So it is very important. But if you've written it all down, that's why yes, it's important. You, yes. you don't need it because yeah. you just get whoever's the closest to you to go, this is where I've left it and read this out, which is what Bernie did, you know. But you see, uh, so many people haven't got an idea when it comes to a reading, whether it's a religious reading mm. or not. Um, you know why he buried George Best? Did you? <laughs> God, this is what, awful. physically? <laughs> what, you actually? It was the biggest, I mean, it's the most surreal honour of my life. But um, I got a phone call one day after George died and from his family. And they said, Eamon, we're not religious. George wasn't religious. Um, we don't want a vicar or a priest yeah, over this, burning. whatever it is. We want someone to conduct his funeral. I'm going right. And I think they're going to say, mm. who would you recommend? Yeah. And they said, and so the family have sat down to, and they thought, you. Went, Me? Me? Now, this, this was a man who I idolized right and who this was the biggest funeral ever held in northern yeah. ireland he's the most famous person that's ever come from northern ireland and you know what i knew i had to do it i didn't seek to do it but i had to do it and it was at parliament buildings in stormont and it's an amazing driveway down down to the main road it was the worst day weather-wise it, it, torrential rain, bibl biblical proportions. And I had to keep it together that day. And I just kept thinking, that's Georgie. That's George, the Belfast boy, in that coffin in front of me. But it was the most tremendous honour yeah. to be asked to do that and officiate, to say the words. That's what I was doing. I was saying the words and I was introducing the readers and things like that. But that, that was an amazing thing. So if, um, do you ever think about what you want when you go? Yeah. I'm quite clear. I'm quite straight about what Have I you want. told people? Yeah. Nobody listens to me. No, but they will. Tell yeah. me. I'll make sure well, it happens. I want you there. 
Okay. And I want, oh, I'll be there. I want quite a lot of women there. <laughs> And I want them in black. Just to annoy Ruth. I know you. No, no, it just makes me look better. I just look, because people would say, was there ever anything between them, do you think? Why is Colin crying so much? You know, disproportionately to everybody else. I, and I'd like a veal. Which I will be. Yeah, I'd like a veal. I like women there. Black, oh, yeah. And black veal. Yeah, yeah. And looking, you know. What they in, call mantillas or something like that. They're Spanish ones, yeah. But just dressed in black. Black mm. coats or black So you want suits. everyone in black. You want traditional Absolutely. black. Absolutely. Do Abs- you? Absolutely like a uniform. I think sometimes it's a dog's dinner when people turn up in overcoats and T-shirts and different colours and whatever it is. And I think, for goodness sake, people used to dress to go to church. Oh, you're so like my brother, Brian. Yeah? Because Bernie wanted, not wanted, but she was like, wear what you want. But you know, you don't all have to be in black. But to I my brother, Brian, mm-hmm. it's like, I'm wearing black. Yeah. It's He sees it as... Uh, uh, respect. I've, I've gone, you know? yes, respect. Mm. I've gone to funerals where the code has been wear a t shirt, whatever, and I've turned up in the full black suit, mm. whatever. It's just because that's me saying, this is the way I want to pay my respects. And but do you want it to be, is it going to be a very solemn? Do you want people to be very solemn? Of course, or? yes. I want people. Do you? To, yes, I want crime. I want. You see, if that happens now, I'm going to laugh. Because I'll be thinking, I know he wants me standing here sobbing, <laughs> but the thoughts of him saying that is making me laugh. No, see in showbiz, have you had this there over my coffin for the Rec Room Mass? Here or Ireland? Oh, definitely Belfast. Yeah. Patrick's Cathedral. Not, it's not a cathedral, it's what's called a pro-cathedral. It's between a church and a cathedral, but it's where I was baptised. It's where my mother and father were. Mm. Uh, it's our, it was our parish constituency. It was... Um, you know everything is, is you know it's 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 where life mm. happened for us yeah so um i would like that and i mean it was not too much to ask i think no lower than a bishop um conducting but you know maybe you know a cardinal or you know someone like that a cardinal or bishop maybe a monsignor but you know i think about that rank yeah um I, i'd stop short at a state funeral but but do you expect a holiday for Belfast, like a, a holiday work-wise, everyone well, has like, the day I'd off. Well, I like people in the streets with their heads bent. Yeah. For at least a mile. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Don't! I'm feeling the pressure already if you go here, if this doesn't happen. I feel um, like I've let you down. There's no chance of it happening. Yeah, I but, bet you know, there is. But I like the idea of black and I like the idea... I do think that the Cardinal should take a day off to... to, uh, to say, the Requiem Mass. Well, a oh, Requiem Mass, they go on for days. They're like four hours. Well, yeah, but plenty of incense every now and again, oh. you know, and candles and things God. like that. And then, you know, and then I've got my brothers and um, I've got Leonard as the eldest and then comes me and then comes Brian, who's a year younger than me, and then uh, Colm and Connor. And they they would carry the coffin. Mm-hmm. They would be my pallbearers. And that would be a tremendous honour. Music? Well, the music would be, I like all traditional church music and there's a fellow called Malachi Kush, who's a singer in Ireland. I'd like him to sing some stuff. And then um, there is, um, either would like on record or an Elvis impersonator um, to sing as the final song. Right. Bridge Over Troubled Water. Oh, really? Great. If you're lonely, <laughs> feeling blue, ooh. Let's hope he sings the right lyrics. <laughs> but, you know, but, but I think it's a great song to reflect on. Um, you know, when times get rough, yeah. I'll be down mm. like a bridge over troubled water. And I just think it's a good song. You wouldn't necessarily get that at a mass because... You can it's not sing religious, it. is it? Yes, you can sing mm-hmm. it at the end of the Mass. Yeah. So as, as long as the priest finishes the Mass and you're going down the aisle, mm. they can sing They can sing it then. So burial, not cremation? Oh, definitely burial. Oh, really? I know the plot. I know that we've got a family plot in Belfast and um, definitely where my mum and dad is. And... Uh, and there's room for four others, so we should be fighting each other to get in there. Where's but, Ruth going? Well, Ruth doesn't. Ruth, Ruth wouldn't consider. Ruth would rather be somewhere anonymous in Surrey or whatever, where neither she or I have any relations. So no one's ever going to visit you. Um, and she wants to be cremated, and I don't want to be cremated. So I de- very definitely know my view 
you know, the Cave Hill to my right, Belfast Lock to my left. Have you had this discussion with Ruth? Yes, 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 yes. Do you argue about it or? No, 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 she doesn't care. She's not religious. She's not, she's not interested in the sentimentality of anything like that. She just wants burnt and scattered. Yeah, but does she want to be put with you or does she just not Nothing care? It wouldn't matter to her. Really? It genuinely wouldn't matter to her. So do you think it's, because um, I do, that it's really important that people can have these discussions? Absolutely. Look, I'll tell you this. My brothers who wouldn't necessarily discuss this, but I know they all visit my parents' grave and I know they clean and polish it mm. and I know they'll just pull up in their car and they'll sit down beside the grave and they'll have a bit of a chat for you mm. know, a couple of minutes or maybe longer or if they're just having a heavy day, it gives them a bit of peace. The, the, the plot where we are is a little bit... Um, detached it's not in the middle of hundreds and hundreds of graves mm. it overlooks if you're right, with me yeah. so there's a privacy to it and um but would you know what your brothers would want if no. they passed away no well why don't you talk about that with them though um I'd, I'd be happy to talk about it we're questioning them talking about me i mean i, I would raise the conversation yeah mm. but i'm just telling you that i know very clearly i would want a traditional funeral uh quite formal everybody wearing black and buried in the family plot. And crying a lot. And crying a lot. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to not say that. Not I'm going to laugh. <laughs> I'm going to laugh. But the scene, the scene you mean, you see, means... instantly you're saying you've got to be crying, you've got yeah. to be sad. Yeah. It makes me want to laugh. I've got a really warped sense of... I think it's nerves. But when you go to the uh, afterwards, the wake, whatever afterwards... Then um, you can have a laugh. Everybody will be laughing. Yeah. As you say, maybe you go to the loo and you dab your yeah, eyes. Yeah. Maybe you are... But, you know, I think if people gathered around and they were able to say, I could give you him and he was a pain in the backside, he was this, that or whatever it is. But you know what? He was a decent man. He could say that about you at the end of your yeah. your days. They were a decent person. So what would be your epitaph? What would be your three? If you could only have three words. Who? Oh. You know what they would be? Go on. Was that it? <laughs> Uh, and That's this question genius. mark might count as a fourth. I don't know. Uh, was that it? Because I genuinely look, and you know, at the end of the day, the only thing that marry, matters is your family, is your health, hmm. or you know, and that you're good to people and people think kindly of you. Um, but but at the end of the day, wherever you go, whatever you do, you still go back to the girl, the little girl that you were, or yeah, the, absolutely, the, the, you know. The, council house that I lived in or whatever it happens to be I don't pretend to be anybody different well I you know I could sit here and chat to you for days yes actually so what did you and Colin talk about today death, death. death. yeah but we laughed but we did laugh and I think philosophically it doesn't have to be the end of the world believe me there are different categories of grief and I'm not underestimating mm. um death sudden sudden death is a difficult thing for yeah, people to deal with as well mm. but then you know, I had the chance to say goodbye to my mother. Did I say goodbye <coughs> to my mother? Yes, I did. Yeah. I did. And, but I was doing it over Zoom and Skype and things mm. that, you know, and she would, you know, and she would say that she loved me and whatever, which she wouldn't have said in real life, mm. really. But yeah. she would have done things. I mean, I, you knew. I was very, clo <coughs> very close. We were, we were a very close family. But we are, um, you know, it's different. Ruth often says, um, I can't believe the way you speak to your brothers, the way your brothers speak to you. But you can only speak to people who you love and you're very close with in a harsh way. Uh, absolutely. You know? Yeah. So, Coming from big families, you yes, know that yeah. as well. Yeah. But yeah, but again, speaking is very important um, nowadays. I think people need to speak more about the topic that we're mm -hmm. having. Mm -hmm. And like you say, you can't compare it to, you know, yeah. everyone grieves. But ultimately, we all have to carry on. And the best way to carry on is to help each other through our grief. You, and, and remembering. And remember. I, I do believe that thing. That if you think Dad would have loved that, mm. Bernie would have loved that, yeah. that would have been great. Mm. You keep them alive in your yeah. heart and soul, and they enter. And I do find it amazing the amount of times that something they would have said or done or yeah. approved of or not approved of. That's the other thing. At the end of the day, you know what's who someone you loved around you. Would Whether have, it be they approve of what you're doing yeah, or not. Yeah. And also the thing that gets me out of bed sometimes when I don't want to is I, I literally hear Bernie going, get out of bed, you lazy cow. 
because, you know, that's what she was like. And she said, you can grieve for me for two weeks and then just shut up and get on with it because life goes on. Mm. You know, and that's the other thing is the cruelty of life does go it on. It does go on. I remember when my dad died and, you know, I got back late that night in the plane. I was out in the car the next day and where he collected his newspaper every day and the bakery that he uh, collected his baps in the morning and various things. He had this routine of things. And the guy that ran the news agents was standing at the front of the shop laughing with another man outside and there was people going in and out of the bakery and they were laughing. Everybody was happy. Mm. And I, I remember going, do they not realise my dad's just died? Yeah. Do they not realise? I think that's the biggest shock when someone dies yeah. the next day when you think, oh, life actually just goes, does, on. Just goes on. Yeah. People still go to work. And, yeah. and at first I found that really hard to deal with. Um, but it does go on and I think um, the more we openly talk about it and the more and the less scared we are of it because I think people are scared to talk about what they want for the funeral or how they want people to be or how they want to be I think they're scared because it's almost like they feel they're tempting fate by talking about yeah. it but it's so so important if you want to take you know the stress you know from your family of the stress they're going through anyway when you yeah, when you I go a dilemma, very good friend Back in Ireland, lost his grandchild who was six years of age oh, to cancer. God. And, you know, we all got in touch and everything was, you know, everybody said what they had to say. And two weeks later, we, we talked together about football. So we watched football. He's in Belfast, I'm here, and we're watching football. And there's a number of other people with a WhatsApp group and whatever. And he came on the phone. He says, what do you make of that or whatever? And so I had this five minute conversation with him and I didn't once mention his granddaughter. And I felt so guilty when I put the phone down because I thought, does he think I don't care? Because I do yeah. care. But what I thought was maybe I've just given him 90 minutes where he doesn't, doesn't think. have to because he's thinking about her 24 yeah. seven. Yeah. He, he doesn't need me to remind him mm. of his grief, but I don't know what the right way is. It's just my way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Eamon, thank you so much. I really, really you have no idea how much I appreciate you doing this because oh, I know, you know, with all your physical pain that you're actually in. It's, but I didn't think of pain when hard. I'm talking to you. <laughs> you don't you don't think of it. You don't no. think I will think of it when I try and get off. I know, chair. but I do honestly I really appreciate <laughs> thank it. You very you're much. such um you're such a great friend. Thank and you. I love you and Ruth very much. You're very kind. Black feel. Black veil, and lots even, of tears. Even if you're not crying, just pretend you are with a white uh, tissue. No, trust me, I will be crying. Okay. Because the thoughts of life without you are just not worth bearing about. Thank bearing. You very much. Um, God bless you. Thank love you, very you loads. Thank, Thank you. you for coming in. Hello, ladies, and welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make you introduce yourselves on this because I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> uh, my name is Tracy Harriman. I'm a funeral arranger down on the south coast for Co op Funeral Care. Lovely. I'm Yolanda Clark and I work for Cruise Bereavement Support in the Manchester area. I'm an administrator, I'm a bereavement support volunteer, I'm a supervisor and I'm a group facilitator. And that's why I didn't read it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have never remembered that, that's a lot. I just about remember it myself. That's a lot of pressure on you there, you're covering a lot of things. Well, I'm going to start with you actually, okay. Yolanda. Um, and I've got things written down here because I want to really make sure this is right for everyone that's listening. Um, I'm going to start by saying... Why is talking about death in our lives so important? And would discussing it more openly make it better equipped for when, for when the time comes? Well, there's one thing we're sure of, and that is that everybody will die. And we don't want to face that, but mm. it's the truth. So we come across death, whether it's uh, navigating the death of a loved one or whether it's facing our own mortality. So death is a part of life. We watch the news, death is on there. We watch films, death's on there. So it is a part of life, but we shy away from it. Mm. So it's really important that we start talking about it so it doesn't feel like the big scary monster mm. that, that in some cultures they accept because death is part of life and it's part of the circle of life. Mm. Mm. And um, in what ways can seeing a loved one through an illness affect the grief process? You grieve several times when somebody's ill. So there's something called anticipatory grief. And that's the grief you feel when you anticipate somebody's going to die. There's lots of ups and downs because they might go through a good period and then they might be ill and then you worry that they might die and then they get better. So there's lots of ups and downs and emotions um, to do with anticipatory grief and grieving before somebody's died. Mm. 
So Elizabeth Kubler-Ross actually created the five stages of grief for somebody who had a terminal illness because they were the stages that that person went through. And then it was put towards bereavement. Mm. So actually there's grieving for the person who's dying. So um, there's a person supporting that grief. And then when the person dies, there's another type of grief. Yeah, that's so true, actually, because, you know, when my mother, I've talked about many times when she had Alzheimer's and she had it for about the last five years of her life. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was grieving for five years because I was mm -hmm. losing her a bit more. Every losing year. her in stages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then actually, when she passed away, there was an element of relief. I know yeah. that sounds awful, but there was because I thought she's out of her misery. Yeah. Um, and it was hard for us to watch her go through that. And the actual grief started probably a year after, which took me by surprise. And no one had explained that that's kind of natural. Mm -hmm. So I felt bad for a year, mm -hmm. thinking, why am I not, why am I just carrying on like she's still there? Definitely, well, a lot of people experience that relief because you're watching somebody suffer and it is mm. really hard when you're caring for somebody mm. to watch them go through that. You know, uh, they may be angry, they may be upset with you, you may be trying your best. Mm. Um, I always think it's harder for somebody who's going because they're losing everybody. Yeah. We, we lose that one person, but they're losing everybody. Mm. Um, so yeah, so relief, as, as you said, is a massive thing that people feel, but then also there's a lot of guilt associated with that. Mm. I shouldn't feel guilty that they're dead, but actually if you've watched them suffer, it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, it's a whole host of mixed emotions, isn't yeah. it? Well, Tracy, I'll ask you, how does talking about, for instance, the funeral wishes, how does that help loved ones when the time has come? Do you know, it, it takes the pressure off. When someone dies, there are so many other things that have to be dealt with. It's not just the funeral. So you might be dealing with solicitors. Mm. Um, you might be having to go through probate. If it was a sudden death, you're probably having to deal with the coroner. Mm. And then having that pressure of thinking, I don't know what my loved one would have wanted for the funeral. Mm. That, that can be quite intense. But having that pressure taken away and knowing that you are doing what your loved one wanted and accepting their wishes and going along with their wishes and providing the best send-off that they can have, mm. knowing that they would be thinking, yeah, this is what I wanted. It, it's a relief mm. and yeah. it takes a lot of the pressure off. Mm. Yeah. Because obviously you have to do all of those things, mm. but equally you're dealing with grief. Yeah, you're so dealing if you can with take grief. the pressure off one side of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's all in such a small space of time as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yolanda, everybody's kind of at a different place on the comfort scale when it comes to talking about grief. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody doesn't feel really comfortable or happy discussing funerals at all, what is the best way to navigate around that? Well, there's a stigma around talking about death and dying. So the person has to feel comfortable. So it's approaching it in a way that feels comfortable for them. So they may have been to a funeral and said, oh, I like that wicker basket mm. or wicker coffin. And it's taking that on board and just expanding the conversation when it happens. Mm. So don't force people because it's really difficult. It brings up difficult emotions in people and they can get angry or they can get upset and then they can shy away from the conversation. Mm. So it's being really patient with that person. It may be, if you're doing a will or a lasting power of attorney, it may be a time to actually introduce funeral planning in that mm. because you're having the conversation anyway. Mm. So it's just finding a time and a space that makes it feel comfortable. Um, you know, my friends have got elderly parents and they're dying. So we've started to talk about the process of grieving because they know I've, I've been through it. So once that conversation started, we started talking. We've also started talking about our own funerals. Mm. So it's just finding the right in to start those conversations. Mm. Do you think it is that we still have such a, naturally, a big fear 
of death. Oh, it's still a taboo. Yeah. It's still a huge taboo. And, and it's almost like, oh, well, no, if I talk about it, it's tempting fate. I don't yeah. want to talk about it. I don't even want to think yeah. about that right now. But it is so important, isn't it? It is. And, and, you know, we can learn a lot from different cultures. Mm -hmm. um, lots of different cultures mm -hmm. are quite open talking about it. I loved listening to Eamon talking yeah. to you about how, how the Irish in general mm. approach funerals yeah. and approach death because they're, they're much more adult about it if, mm. if you like they're, they're they're happy to talk about it because they know it's going to happen mm. and you know by taking away that fear and by accepting it mm. it does make it so much easier when mm. the time comes yeah it's also a learnt behavior because if you have been taught mm. to be fearful of death that's what you're going to do so it's a re-education so mm, everybody yeah. has to be re-educated yeah. and start from when people are little. Take children to funerals. Don't let them think it's some s really serious um, secret society. Let them know what it's like to grieve mm. and be part of that grieving. Mm. It's bringing it in naturally as well. You don't have to sit down with someone and say, right, OK, this mm. is what I want for my funeral mm. or what do you want for mm. your funeral? Um, and I know one way of introducing it more with my son, we, we've had the odd little little conversation mm. before, was actually watching the Queen's funeral. Mm. Oh, right, yeah. And yeah. I kind of made that it... That always starts a conversation, yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. So I made very light of it and yeah. said to my boy, I hope you're paying attention because this is mm -hmm. what I want. Yeah. But, you know, perhaps show <laughs> tunes instead of the hymns. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and we made a little bit of a joke yeah. about mm. it. But... If you can treat but it, but that as will stay in there for him. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. But it, 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 again, it makes it easier to kind of keep bringing it up through life and not, not being Shying afraid of it and it, not yeah. treating it as a taboo. Yeah. If you can introduce the conversation yeah. naturally and not treating it as something that's got to be a sit down serious mm. conversation mm. and this is what we're going to talk about today, mm. then it makes it easier in the long run to, to treat it as, mm. as a natural process. It's like um, my daughter said to me recently actually, when my sister Bernie passed away, my mm. daughter was on a school trip mm. and over in Paris, I think it was, lucky her, so I never got <laughs> school trips like that. Um, but she only said to me the other day, because at the time, thinking I was doing the right thing, because she was like 11 or 12, mm. I think. And I thought, no, let her have her school trip. But obviously mm. the funeral was happening. Mm. And um, she said the other day, my biggest regret is that I didn't see Auntie Bernie. Mm. And you think you're doing something mm, right as do. a parent of protecting them from mm. that. But actually, if we'd have been able to, I should have asked her. I should have said do you want to come home for the funeral? But I didn't. I just thought, no, she's better away. Children are really resilient yeah. if we give them the opportunity. We tend to wrap them in cotton wool. Mm -hmm. yeah. But actually, they can face more than we give them credit for. Yeah, because she feels like she didn't really get to say goodbye properly. Mm. Children still need closure. Yeah. They do. They do. But equally, what about if children go, I don't want to? Like my That's eldest funny. son, Shane, is very, don't want to, don't want to, when he was younger especially. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's fine too, is it? Yeah, it's people find yeah. their own ways of saying goodbye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't have to be stood in a church or a crematorium. So, what are some of the personal ways a family can remember a loved one? And do you feel people are fully aware of all the choices available to help them remember a loved one? I think there is still, as as much as we try and promote the idea that you don't have to go down the traditional road of of everyone wearing black, and I know it appealed to Eamon, yeah. and I know that's what and Eamon, my brother, yeah, a lot of, a lot of yeah. people do like still want that. Yeah, they yeah. do still want that. People still think they've got to have the Lord's my shepherd or abide mm -hmm. with me um, during the funeral service. I think people are starting to wake up a bit more now and realise that there are different options, mm -hmm. which is really, really good. But mm -hmm. equally, if people do want a traditional religious funeral service, then, then that's what they can have. Yeah. But. I love the idea, actually, of Eamon um, wanting a, an Elvis, I, I an Elvis tribute. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. And, and actually... Have you had some, oh. like, comical... Well, not comical, but unusual requests yeah, about Yeah, humans? and actually, that was a really nice way of, of pairing up the traditional with something personal. Mm, mm. Okay, so it doesn't have to be one or the other. But actually, I work, I work with a team member who um, who is uh, an Elvis tribute act in his spare time. Oh, right. So there have been times when he's donned his rhinestone studded white suit and driven the hearse and, and even sung at a couple of funeral services. So, yeah, I think so like there's no reason like why that. you can't... <laughs> <laughs> we can arrange it. <laughs> Just remember I said that, okay. Maybe not Elvis, I'll think of someone. Um... 
how have the way people remembered loved ones changed in recent years? Do you think it's much more like that now where it's less traditional? It, it definitely is. Um, we, <laughs> we actually arranged one not so long ago where we had a, a full-size cardboard cutout of a Chippendale make an appearance, <laughs> you know. So there are things that you Just can do to... Just going to mark that one down on my list. <laughs> <laughs> Not cardboard cut out. A real, a real, a real chip and dale, yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. But yeah, so there are so many different ways that you can personalise the service mm. with things like that. And, mm. and like I said, people are seeing that more and more. Um, there's a, a big swing a lot more to towards direct cremations. Mm. Um, and it was interesting here in Eamon say that, no, you, you should attend a funeral yeah. service. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very important to him. Um but actually you can find other ways of saying goodbye. So mm. even if someone did want a direct cremation, that's okay, as long as you're giving the family and friends that opportunity to have closure yeah. and finding another way. So um, how can Co-op Funeral Co help you to start the conversation about your funeral wishes? Well, that that's, comes into what their wishes are. So um, it might be that we're going down the road of actually taking out a funeral plan for them, in which case we can go through the options. It might just be enabling them and equipping them with better knowledge about what there is available so mm. that they can have a think about it and go back and talk to the family and say, hey, what would you think about having an Elvis tribute mm. at my funeral? Yeah, but I think the conclusion is, again is not being a, not being scared to talk because like you've mm. said and you've said mm. and we all know it's the one definite about our life is that at some point we're going to die oh, it's a horrible statistic isn't it it's that awful a hundred percent of <laughs> yes, the people yeah. that you love your mm. family and friends yeah. they are all going to die yeah you know we need to be talking about this it needs to become a kind of natural conversation and not yeah. a fearful one yeah definitely. you know i think it's just the sadness of it isn't it you don't want anyone you love to go really it's, it is no. sad i mean i've got a great niece and great nephew and they've never met my dad but they've visited his grave they've tidied it up and they know who he is mm. yeah so um my, my great nephew sat thinking and i said what's up and he said is grand is granddad in there mm. so i said well it depends on what you believe i said i believe he's like a bird in the sky and mm. he's He's free and he's flying and he comes to say hello. And just as I said that, a bird flew over. Oh, really? So every time he goes to the grave and sees a bird, he said, there's granddad. So Aww. I'm introducing death to him in a way that's accessible to him. So it's how you broach the subject. It's yeah. how you talk mm. about it. So that's the thing. Keep talking. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So interesting. Um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we have a laugh now? Yeah, yeah let's. <laughs> 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 this podcast is a reach studio production brought to you by co-op funeral care as part of its new let's start talking campaign don't forget to subscribe to let's start talking on apple google or spotify and you'll never miss an episode i've been your host colleen nolan and if you'd like more information or guidance visit coop.co.uk forward slash conversation